There's a guy that we worked that, we, that worked, was in here, and he had a lot of ability, uh, but he was kind of hard headed. And uh, basically, if you're in a situation where there's a certain person that's in authority and you're supposed to do what they say, if they tell you to do something, you're really supposed to do it. You know, nobody, I'm not going to tell you to do anything unreasonable. You know what I mean? I'm not going to tell you to climb up on top of a building and stand on your head or nothing stupid like that. But I was saying, uh, one day I told him, I mean, there were, I mean, it seemed like a lot of stuff I told him to do, he just wouldn't do it. He just, if he didn't want to do it, he just wouldn't do it. And he just, uh, and so uh, one day I wrote this little uh, little story of sorts. And uh, it's kind of funny. The, uh, the story that I wrote was about me talking to a service manager at a dealership that was looking to hire somebody. And which test you got there? Four? Okay. And so he says, um, I wrote it for him, and I said, I wrote a story, and uh, you're in it. He says, really? Cool. So what I had was I'm having this interview with the service manager, and the service manager says, well, tell me about this guy. I said, I want to hire somebody and pay him 19, 20 bucks an hour because we're down here on the interstate, and it's going to be a pretty you know, uh, lucrative position. And uh, what can you tell me about this guy's work habits? You know, is he dependable? Well, yeah, he's, he's at, you know, at school, he spent every day. Oh, and how's he about finishing what he starts? Well, you know, well, how's he about following orders and doing what you ask him to do? Well, he doesn't usually do that. Oh, he doesn't? No. Well, give me an example. Said, well, there was this stuff that was took apart over here that I needed to put back together. When I told him to put it back together, he just didn't do it. And I had to get somebody else to do it. And then I told him to do some other stuff back at the back of the shop, and he didn't do that either. And he says, well, I'm going to have to hire somebody else. I'm not going to have to use this guy. <laughs> anyway, I let him read the story. And did you know from that day on, his entire outlook changed? And everything I asked him to do after that, he did it right away. And he, when he went to work at the place he finally went to work, when he graduated from here, he worked at that place for three months. And the guy that owned the place called a meeting. And he says, I don't need anybody to run this place except me and him. This is a guy that graduated from here. And so he says, the rest of y'all, you're done. Get out. <laughs> he fired everybody else because they weren't doing anything. They were was breathing his air and wasting his money, but this boy would work. And, and, and he was, it was perfect because the kid didn't live but about a mile up the road from the place where he was working, so he didn't hardly burn any gas to get there or nothing. And he came back later, and he told me, he says he fired his daughter. He fired the other mechanics that were working there. And when Christmas came, he bought me a brand new toolbox. <laughs> and so that's the kind of thing. You want to be the guy that they don't want to get, you know what I'm saying, that, they're, that they don't want to lose. You want to be the guy they don't want to lose. And too many people I see, particularly coming through here, is that how little can I do and still get by? You know, and you, you, do, you go to the workplace like that, it's just not good. In a military situation, you see people like that. And that is not helping anybody. I mean, that doesn't help anybody whenever you've got a, a group of people who are supposed to have cohesion, you know. Okay. Uh, engine performance one, test four, after telling the story. Uh, technician A says, city deposits may be the result of improper engine operating temperature. Technician B says, sooty deposits result from an engine running too hot. You got any idea? If you see soot, sooty deposits in the exhaust pipe or on the spark plugs, where does soot come from? What is soot? The black soot. Carbon. It's hydrocarbon. Yeah, it's carbon, but it's hydrocarbon. And what that means is you've actually got an engine that's running too rich and too cold. Because when it's cold, it's going to run richer, right? Why does it need to run richer when it's cold? Think about your carburetor. Your carburetor, you choke, the choke is closed. You got less air and more fuel, uh, and it has to run a little richer when it's cold. That's why your air, uh, your AIR system, you know, your thermactor, whatever you call it, Ford call it that. General Motors call it an air injection reactor. Will actually pump air into the exhaust right there outside the cylinder, so that it would use up, you know, it would add oxygen molecules to that, and it wouldn't be soot. It would actually, you know, complete the combustion process after the fact. Didn't have to do that after the engine got warm because it all happens in the cylinder. And then that uh, on those older cars, like in the 80s and in the early 90s, they would divert that air down there and they would start feeding it to the exhaust system between the two bricks on the catalyst, so that the the front brick, the light off catalyst, doesn't need oxygen in order to work right. The back brick does, 
The front brick takes care of oxides of nitrogen. The back brick takes care of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. By adding a molecule. All right. Anyway, that's another course. Uh, technician A says radiators should be checked and serviced when the engine is rebuilt or replaced. Let me tell you about radiators. Particularly if a if a car's got 140, 150 thousand miles on it, and your mama's going to head for California on it or something, you probably ought to put a radiator in it just on general principle. Radiators don't cost that much. And most of the time, they're not all that hard to change. But those radiators now that are made of aluminum and plastic, they can give way without warning and destroy that car and make it a boat weight. Seen it before. Beside the road, see somebody over there and they stop and they got a fairly late model Cadillac or some kind of car they're driving. I've actually seen this. You open the hood and the engine's burned up to the point where it won't even start. And you, you got no compression anymore because the temper's going out of the rings. And they've been sitting here a little bit long enough for it to cool off. You look down there, it's a big long crack down one of those radiator tanks. And so what I'm saying is most of my vehicles, you know, typically they'll wind up getting a radiator when they hit about 120K, you see. I mean, it doesn't cost a lot to put a radiator in there and your hedge in your bed. Now, you may get away with not having, you know, with keeping a radiator in the same radiator there for 250,000 miles, but I don't like gambling like that. Something else, belt tensioners, belt tensioners can pop without warning. I mean, it's all of a sudden. I've had it happen on my car. The doggone belt tensioner, there's a little money there, but you're better off to have a new belt tensioner if you got 120,000, you know, 240,000 miles. Put a new belt tensioner on it ever so often, and you're better off. And I ain't talking about every time you change the oil, but you know what I'm saying. You got a lot of miles on a car. If it breaks past 120K, you better start looking around under the hood. You don't want to just, and it's kind of like seeing what's the least I can get by with. I taught a class in here uh, to these uh, bunch of women. It was just a free class, and I taught like two hours one night about uh, car, uh, maintaining your vehicle. And if you go by the owner's manual, do everything it says to do, you're going to spend some money on it but you're also going to hedge your bets against having problems. And they were just sort of shocked. At how, you know, we, we got to do all this. Well, the car does a lot for you, and it doesn't ask for much of anything. <laughs> and if it takes some of your hard-earned money, then you shouldn't complain about it because it's, it's, it gives a lot, you know. And uh, this one guy that I was listening to the other day, he says, uh, foreign cars, uh, when somebody buys a car that's like a Honda or a Toyota or a Hyundai or one of these other cars, they have a vision for that car. They want it to last. They plan on driving at 150, 200, 300,000 miles. They plan on that. And from the very day that they start driving that car, usually they will make sure they follow every, they check off every box in that maintenance book to make sure that they hedge that bet. But if they drive, if buy a Chevrolet or a Dodge or a Ford, the American car makers have to make one that will take a beating and keep on kicking, or you can take a lick and keep on, because they're not gonna get maintained like the Japanese cars are. That's by and large. You see what I mean? But anyway, each gallon of fuel, uh, oh wait a minute, uh, technician, both technicians are right there. Technician A B always replaces a water pump, thermostat, and rubber hoses when reconditioning an engine. Um, if you're getting a used engine and putting in one, it's always a good idea to see if there's sludge in it. Because you may have an engine with low mileage. Let's say somebody, uh, let's say your Cobalt is going to get another engine. Let's say you, for whatever reason something's happened, you've got to put an engine in your Cobalt. And let's say the engine supplier says, we got an engine with 35,000 miles on it. That's just the year model for your car. That sounds really good, but if Grandma and Grandpa drove that thing to the store and back and didn't let it get warm, it's going to be sledged up. And you have a sledged up engine. It may clean on the outside and nasty on the inside. So a lot of times... Uh, what I've done, if I suspect that, I'll pull the easiest cover to get access to, like a valve cover or something like that. I'm going to look under there and see if it's got sledge in there. If it's all sledged up, you know, we do what we can to de-sledge that as good as we can to make sure there's not a bunch of sledge in the oil pan that's going to clog up the screen. But just because it, just because the engine's got low miles on it, if it's a, what's your, you go 06, 05? It's a 06, it's 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, and it's got 30,000 miles on it. Well, why has it got so few miles on it? I'm curious about that. And did, 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 did Grandma and Grandpa drive it to the store and back every day and just kill ants in the driveway with it and stuff? If they did, you've probably got issues. Run that thing warm. Uh, for each, and this both technicians there, by the way. Uh, and we would always we always like to put a rear main seal on there and, uh, you know, and a water pump. If you're putting a used engine in it or reconditioning one, too, obviously you're going to put a water pump on it and all that kind of stuff. For each gallon of fuel used in an automotive engine, how much moisture is produced? A gallon, a gallon of water for every gallon of fuel. Did you know that? You're producing a gallon of water for every gallon of fuel? 
Did you know the Environmental Protection Agency has classified water vapor as a greenhouse gas? Do we need to shoot down the clouds? What? They generally have. I mean, I'm not kidding. I'm not making that up. They've actually, okay, water vapor, if you look at a graph, water vapor is mostly, is the, is the most uh, greenhouse gas effect. If you look at CO2, it's down here on the graph. Water vapor is like way up here. Greenhouse gas, I mean, that little tiny bit of carbon monoxide, I mean, carbon dioxide is not causing as much of a water, uh, greenhouse gas problem as water vapor. You can't do anything about water vapor, can you? I mean, hurricanes come and there's clouds up there and all that kind of stuff. Okay, but you're making a gallon of water every time you burn a gallon of fuel in a, in a car. Right. Okay, how many gallons of air are you burning per gallon of fuel by volume? Air. Remember this, this is important. How many gallons of air are you burning per gallon of fuel? Now the 14.7 and 1 is by weight, not by volume. 9,000 gallons of air per gallon of fuel. That's a lot in it. 9,000 gallons of air. All right. Uh, did you know that? Did you know that one of the things that comes out of your tailpipe though is water? You ever cranked an engine in the winter time? What comes out of the gas pipe? I mean, what comes out of the exhaust pipe? Steam. That same stuff is coming out all the time. You just don't see it when the engine's really hot. Okay. Now then, low. Uh, Oh, and by the way, the blow-by carries some of that moisture down into your crankcase, and that starts to mix with the oil. That's where the sludge comes from if you're running it too cold all the time. <laughs> if you get it good and hot, the PCV system takes care of that. All right. uh, a lot of the stuff you don't want to think about. Low engine operating temperatures will cause all of the following except, now this is an ASE-style question, uh, accumulation of water in the oil, it'll do that. Rust formation, it'll do that. Cylinder wall wear, it'll do that. All of these are symptoms of low operating temperatures. That's a D. The following statements are correct, except, this is another ASC style question, operating temperatures are too high, uh, too high increase medical, mental, mental contact. Because the oil is going to, yeah, the oil is going to get real thin. Operating temperatures too low will thin the oil. No. Uh, operating temperatures too high causes detonation and pre-ignition. Operating temperatures too high will cause sticking valve lifter plungers. Now, operating temperatures too low I think, in spite of this question here, and I don't, I mean, will it can thin the oil because if the engine is always running kind of rich, because the engine coolant sensor is reading a cold engine, it's going to be running richer, and you're going to see you have gasoline and hydrocarbon stuff going past your rings in the blow-by, it goes by the rings into the crankcase, and if your oil gets contaminated enough with gas, it's going to get thinner, isn't it? Because sometimes that happens. But you're going to have a little bit of fuel contamination in your oil anyway. Um, so, see, uh, the Basically, the B is supposed to be the right answer on that one, so I'll go ahead and put that, but I don't like that answer. Uh, technician A says the thermostat is most often connected to the radiator inlet. Technician B says the thermostat is most often, uh, often located on the bottom of the engine. Who's right on that? You ever think about which way the water flows through the cooling system? Whenever you've got uh, an engine, when you fire up an engine and it starts getting hot, where's the first place the hot water goes? Heater door. The water pump pushes the well. The water pump actually grabs the water. And a water pump the thermostat's closed, but the water uh, goes through the heater core and back because it won't. You want to start getting the heater core warm just as soon as you possibly can, right? And can I? You know, you go out there when your car is cold. Don't you want it to get warm as quick as you can? If they didn't do it that way, you'd be waiting a while before your heater would warm. You cut on the heater and you get your car real good warm. It'll actually might surprise you how much heat that thing will displace. I knew this uh, of this guy that had a cranked his car because it was cold, frost on the glass, and uh, went in the house. And the car sat there and ran for about 30 minutes. He come back out. Oh man, I forgot to turn on the defrost because the windshield was still iced up. See, he just had all. The, the, so he turned on the defrost, that hot air hit the windshield, <laughs> <laughs> broke it. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, let's see. The technician A is right. The thermostat is most often connected to the radiator inlet, uh, meaning the water flows from the engine past the thermostat into the radiator, and it goes back. The low pressure created on the uh, suction side of the water pump is going to cause that water to circulate. You got it? Okay, number seven, the following statements are correct except, Mr. Webb, this one's for you. The radiator inlet is usually at the top of the radiator. 
Is it? Yes or no? Usually. Okay, that's right. The water pump usually connects to the lower radiator hose. Usually. The radiator outlet is usually at the top of the radiator. That's totally dead wrong. The thermostat is usually connected to the upper radiator hose. Now, don't always think. Uh, what, you better, what you better watch out for, sometimes you'll actually see one and you'll see a, a radiator hose going to a housing and you swear the thermostat was under there. But it's not. Now, a perfect example of the screwed up backwards stuff that you see on some cars is those 2.7 liter Chrysler engines, like what the Chrysler Sebring's got. The thermostat is in the block down there behind the air conditioner compressor. And that bottom hose up to it. Go figure. Now, what is the benefit of that, by the way? Thermostat in the bottom. Yeah. Then it's on a bottom hose. Yeah. If you got a bleeder screw on the top, you can just pour water in and it fills all the way up the engine block. Yeah. What keeps the engine block from filling all the way up on ordinarily? And I've told people repeatedly, if you pour water, if you pour a coolant in a radiator, it's not like filling a bucket up with water. You may see water all the way up the top of that radiator neck, but you can have a big air bubble in the block. And some cars have got a bleeder. They got bleeder screws for the, that's the air out. Your radiator, I mean your thermostat, some of your thermostats have got a little uh, ball in a little pinch thing or a little dangly in there, a little small hole, you know about I mean, they won't have, I mean, over in the side, in the flange, you'll have a little ball in there. And that is actually supposed to be positioned up if the thermostat's mounted this way so that the air can hiss out of there. See, there ain't going to be a lot of water going through that, but that air can sure bleed out of there that way, and that's how they fill that up. If you don't have it full, this one guy that, uh, you know, when I've got a bunch of guys out here, like I tell us, some, last time I had a bunch of these uh, high school students put water pumps. I mean, pull water pumps off each car and put them back on. And with two of them in, every one of them didn't fill the cooling system upright. They thought when they got the water pump on, they poured the water in there where you see it, ready they're done. You know, we had a whole bunch of them out here that had air in the block. We had to bleed them all out. And you can tell them this stuff, but for some reason it doesn't sink in. This one boy was in here. And I told him this, I preached that in class over and over and over again. you got to make sure you got it bled out. He was changing a radiator in his own vehicle. Got him a radiator, put it in there. He was in a big hurry. Had a date that night or something. I don't know what the deal was. So he uh, poured the water in there until you could see it. Fired it up. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah, it's okay. So he drives off. And uh, later that day, or maybe the next day, he's in the Winn-Dixie parking lot. His truck's trying to overheat because there's a bunch of air in there, see? So what does he do? He, in a rig, you know, frantic in a big hurry he goes out here and he tucks the radiator cap off which I'd always told him not to do and he gets hot water all over him he gets second and third degree burns all over his belly but his, if he'd have filled it up the way I told him to instead of being in a hurry and you know this is my truck you can't tell me what to do and, you know this kind of stuff <laughs> you know just what, is what it cost you okay always remember that though if you're doing a front wheel drive car and you're filling the cooling system up to begin with Make sure if there's any bleeders, you need to find out about that. You need to go to your, I always like to go to the book and say, you know, cooling system bleeding and look at that and follow those instructions. Do what it tells you to do. Some of them are fairly straightforward. Some of them will surprise you. They got a bleeder you didn't know about. Take that bleeder off. Make sure you bleed the air out as good as you can. If it's a front wheel drive car with an electric cooling fan, you're going to fire it up. You're going to let that fan kicks on and then back off. If the fan kicks on and stays on, and I'm talking about with the air conditioner off. The fan kicks on and stays on and it don't go off, that, that engine's heating up and something's wrong. If the fan kicks on and kicks off and kicks on and kicks off, then everything's working the way it's supposed to. Okay? You got me? You understand why I'm telling you this? This is important stuff. This is the stuff that, the stuff I've known so long, I think everybody ought to know it. If I forget to tell you, then you get in trouble later and try to keep you out of trouble, okay? Uh, don't, be don't get bored with this. All right. Which statement of the regarding cooling systems? Heat transfer explains how radiators work. Heat transfer explains how radiators work. That's the truth. That's true. Heat transfer explains how radiators work. What's the three ways uh, heat is transferred, Sean? Convection, conduction, and radiation. Yeah. Can you explain those? Uh, conduction is like direct contact with a heated object. Uh, radiation is like you get we get radiation heat from the sun just from its rays and all and. Uh, Convection is like heating a fluid, like a gas or a uh, some kind of uh, maybe fluid. antifreeze. Yeah, and it uh, <laughs> spreads heat by just it carries the heat away to be dissipated somewhere else. Yeah, that's it. 
So you all remember that. Convection, convection, conduction, and radiation, okay? Those are the three ways. Hey, young lady. Yeah, uh, yeah we were, uh, let's see, I told you to come over here because of the spark plug stuff. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Uh, um, let me, um, yeah, just, just give me a few minutes. I'll be on. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, now, uh, today's engine uh, performance day, so we got some, you know, she got a tune up. We got to do. All right. Um, let's see. When testing thermostats, technician A uses a pyrometer and says the engine side of the thermostat should be the hottest spot in the cooling system. Technician B said, a pyrometer actually measures heat. You know the temperature gun that you read? Okay. Technician B says incorrect ignition timing may be the cause of engine overheating. Who's correct about that? Both of them. If the engine's too, if the engine, the ignition timing is late, if it's firing too late, a lot of that will be converted to heat instead of power. Of <coughs> course, you know, engines uh, are only about 20% efficient anyway. Okay, we've got a few more here and we'll be done. Technician A says you must completely drain coolant before replacing the thermostat. That's just really not true. You don't have to drain the whole coolant system to replace the thermostat. I will tell you this, though, if you get antifreeze on the belts, they're going to squeal, 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 squeal. It's a pain. So do what you can to keep the antifreeze off the belts, right? Okay. Um, let's see. Technician, wait a minute. Where am I at here? Oh, Technician B says a defective thermostat is always a cause of an engine not getting hot enough. No. That is actually, look at that. The answer to that question, according to the answer key, is B, but I don't like that. That's not always the way a reason an engine overheats. That's hooey. But I'm going I'm to say that the right answer to that one ought to be neither technician. That is downright silly. Technician B says a defective thermostat is always the cause of an engine getting hot. Not, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I was reading that question wrong. Always the cause of an engine not getting hot enough. Now, always usually is a red flag, but in this case, I'm going to say in just about every case, if it's not getting hot enough, the thermostat's a problem. I read that wrong. It doesn't. Sometimes it can cause overheating, but it's not the only reason. But if it's not getting hot enough, you'll even get trouble codes. You'll get a PO128 code when you pull it. PO128 means that it's the thermostat needs to be replaced. PO125 code. That means the engine's running way too cold. Put a thermostat in it. And this is something else that's discouraging to me. Sometimes you'll have to get two or three thermostats to get a good one. If you get a bad batch of thermostats at the parts house, you may put a thermostat in there, it may still run too cold. Well, I misfired, something else is wrong. No, put another thermostat in it, make sure it's bled out and all that. I've seen one at the Ford place. I'd get them out of the parts room at the Ford place, I'd put one in there, still running too cold, put another one in there, I want it to run 200 degrees. That's what I'm shooting for, 200 degrees. You remember that? It's cold is not good. You know, I don't want it running 240 degrees, but I want it running about 200 to 210. That's what I like, okay? Are you okay with this? Right, and you understand what I'm saying? If I ask you these questions later, you'll be able to read them back to me? All right, that's good. Webb's got his head on straight today. Okay, uh, let me see. Which mixture of antifreeze water solution is generally recommended for general automotive use? 50-50. Now, if you were going to mix some up and keep it in your garage, make doggone sure you use distilled water. Because if you use tap water and you let it sit there a long time, it may turn into something, you know, looks like the algae in it or something. But make sure you use distilled water from the grocery store. You can buy it for 88 cents a gallon at Winn Dixie or somewhere, you know, it costs that much. What color is the antifreeze that uses organic additive technology? Orange. That's the orange. That's the propylene glycol, right? What is the correct pH rating for hybrid organic additive technology antifreeze? 11. If you're measuring pH, you're looking for 11. What is the pH of water? Seven. Seven. Seven is the pH of water. If you go down, it's acid. If you go up, it's alkaline. Right? Okay, all of these are functions of antifreeze except what? That's a bad question. All of these are functions of antifreeze. That's D. And finally, number 15, technician A says air with a wind chill below freezing will cause water to freeze in the engine block. Technician B says wind chill will not affect the freezing point of coolant in an engine block. He's right about that. If you've got clear water, and this old man that I worked with back in the 70s, I guess he had done research on this or he'd seen it. He said if you've got clear water in your engine, it's got to get to 27 degrees 
or 26 degrees and stay there for four hours before it'll bust an engine block. And I'm sure that there's probably some variance in that, but that was the rule of thumb that he used. The problem is not that it froze and busted your engine block. The problem is that you don't have enough antifreeze, like almost none, because you've been adding water because you get a leak somewhere. You head out on the road and you got them little bitty flues in the radiator that are in that icy wind, and you're driving down the road, and all of a sudden the radiator's clogged up with ice, and you're overheating. You can damage an engine, destroy it that way. You know, you, you're thinking that hot water going through that radiator is going to be okay, but it'll actually freeze, and it's just like you don't have any, you don't have any flow through your radiator. Air uh, conditioning unit in my bedroom that stopped working for the thing. And I went back here and took the cover off of it, checked, and it was a cake with ice for about five eighths of an inch or something. <laughs> 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 well, purpose, I mean, it wasn't exactly like a compressor like it should, you know or something, whatever is going on that one. Okay, that, that winds us up for today. We've got plenty to do out there this morning.